driven by our perfectionist thinking, we believe that we can avoid the haunting shadow of shame and the fear of unworthiness if we can perform perfectly. In our futile quest for perfection, we either give our struggles more power than they deserve and allow them to become our identity, or we give up hope, settle for the status quo, or pretend like we have it all together. Our push for perfection finds its fuel in our desire to avoid confronting the reality that we need something or, in the case of Christ, someone. Where there is perfection, there is no need for grace, forgiveness, love, faith, or trust. The ugliness of perfectionism causes us to miss and experience the beauty of the gospel. We're so concerned with what we're doing that we lose sight of what God has done. We are enough because Christ is enough. How many perfectionists do we have in the room? Yeah. So most of them just stayed home. We're not, we're not coming. I've already had uh, people emailing me and texting me trying to convince me that their perfectionism is justified. <laughs> it's been incredible. Uh, so I started uh, preparing for this series thinking uh, that I wasn't uh, as much of a perfectionist, um, but uh, that was quickly dispelled. I think I have worse tendencies than I think that I do. Uh, which is all part of the process. And I went in this morning, I confessed to a couple of our perfectionist staff. I said, hey, I am, I think I'm a perfectionist. They says, oh, welcome to, uh, you know, jumping in the water's fine. And I said, if it's not, we'll make it fine, right? And um, so this is, this is what happens. So the, the thing, the reason this, this series is important, we have definitions of things that are largely untested and maybe perhaps undefined. So what I cannot do today is solve everything. What I can do today and what I'm going to try to do today is to make or help us to think differently about something that is trapping us. A lot of us who are sort of my age, perfectionism was a way in which we made sure that things were done right. Yes, it had some uh, uh, problematic approaches to it. What's happening now with the inundation of information with social media a generation behind us is crippled by perfectionism. And it's not just now, because it's not 15 people in your family who know. It's not your friend group at school. It's like the whole world that sees you online and you have access to presenting an image that you know isn't correct. You have the opportunity to present an image that is perfect, that makes you look the way other people think you ought to look or expect you to look or that you expect that other people expect you to look. So we have, we have things that have just made this, and, and, and at some point in time, to be honest, you know, there's two ways to think about this. Like you can say, you know, enough is enough, right? But at some point in time, when your heart and your soul are being ravaged and wrecked and you can't make decisions and you can't live in relationships and you can't enjoy things, you've got to stop, put a line in the sand and say enough is enough. It's time to do something different. Can we agree with that? Can we say, yes, we're going to get behind that? So I want us to think differently about this. And I want us to look in a really interesting place in the scriptures. It's in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five. His sermon is actually three chapters long, five, four, five six, seven, eight. And it's the longest discourse we have where Jesus just talks to a group of people. And there's a lot of things in there. Obviously, I can't go through all of them. I want to focus on two verses that almost never get put together. And so to be able to jump in, I want to just get her on the same page. I want to give us a quick sort of perfection scale or perfection test. And so you can grade yourself on these statements. Just rank yourself. Uh, you can give yourself an A, a B, a C, a D, an E, or, or an F. Or you can give yourself a 1 to 10 or whatever you want to do. You just, we don't have to be perfect on this. Just, just play along. So just some statements to help you think or see or sense where we're going, what we're going to talk about. Uh, so statement number one in sort of this perfection scale is you think that uh, average is failure, right? In your mind, you just think that average is failure. Um, to get a C would be devastating to you. Now, 
Uh, next statement is this, that you would rather get a zero than a C, right? There, it's, it's like all or nothing for you. You'd rather get a zero uh, than a C because at least you could kind of chronically make it that you weren't interested or didn't care rather than you tried and were only average. Uh, number three, you would rather not try something than not do it perfectly. You'd rather just not try. Number three, you procrastinate when you feel pressure. If you don't think you can pull something off or do something perfectly, you're going to immediately, your first posture is gonna be to procrastinate to put it off. Uh, Number five, you are slow to give yourself credit for anything, but you are quick to believe criticism. Is that anybody's deal? Uh, Number six, you get frustrated when you can't do something right out of the gate. I mean, my kids, this is like the homework struggle, right? Come home doing your homework. I can't do this. I'm like, what do you mean you can't do it? You haven't even tried. Well, I looked at it. It's like, okay, have you ever done this before? No. So you, you think that you should be able to just look at this and do it absolutely perfectly the first time. I'm like, well, yes, that's what, that's what people do. It's like, no, that's not what people do. So you get frustrated when you can't do something quickly out of the gate. Uh, Next one, you fear disappointing others. You chronically live with this sense of fear that other people aren't going to approve of you or aren't going to think of you well or are going to think of you as sort of not as smart or not as, you know, a a high performer or whatever it is. You fear disappointing others. Uh, The next one, failure terrifies you. I ask a lot of our perfectionists, you know, tell tell me what you've done to fail. Because if you're not failing, you're not learning, right? I mean, that, we, we got to learn how to figure this out differently. Uh, and then this last one, um, I, I think, is really indicative or really telling that your accomplishment, whatever you've accomplished, always gets diminished or is diminished if the process took longer or it was harder than you think it should have been. If somehow what you accomplished, you could have done faster or better or it could have been different if you would have known, you know, all these things. And so you just constantly beat yourself. Are we all playing in the same ballpark yet? And if you're not, just pick someone you know, and you can just tell them about this later on. So there's been a lot of work done on, and it's so funny, I was, uh, John Acuff wrote a book uh, called uh, Finish, and he talks about, uh, you know, punching perfectionism in the, uh, or um, uh, how to war of perfectionism. And one of the things he talks about, it's really interesting. He says that perfectionism is one of the things that people talk about as though they don't, that like it's a strength that is their weakness. Like when you're in a job interview, he says, you know, you go to a job interview, he says, what are your weaknesses? Well, my weaknesses are, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I just do things too well. And you're, you're trying to say it like a way to, you know, so it's this thing we kind of have a weird relationship with. We're trying to figure out, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, Brene Brown's written a ton on this. If you're familiar with her work, she's written a lot about vulnerability and shame. And uh, she wrote a book called The Gift of Imperfection. One of the things she talks about is she talks to a lot of people who would say they deal with perfectionism, but oh, we don't deal with shame. And what she is famous for saying is that wherever there is perfectionism, shame is always lurking in the shadows. Shame is sort of the root bed of what causes perfectionism, we don't even realize this. She defines perfectionism as sort of an avoidance. It's a philosophy that we don't want to be blamed, we don't want to be judged, we don't want to be ashamed, and what we think is if we can just do things, if we can live perfectly, we can avoid all of those negative emotions. And there goes the, the rat race that a lot of us just have not been able to get out of. So I sat down and I thought, <clears throat> let's come up with a definition of perfection. And then we can sort of figure out what perfectionism is. Because I think a lot of us, we're perfectionists and we don't know why. We don't know how to break it. Um, we end up demanding things from other people that people can't keep up with. And lots of things happen in this sort of way. It ruins joy. Perfectionism ruins joy. It ruins, you know, all kinds of things. You rob yourself of the truth because some of you are so identified with what you do and how you do it that no one can criticize it or offer you any helpful feedback to it. 
You, you don't ever learn to grow. You don't ever learn to actually relate to other people because everybody is afraid that if they say something to you, it's going to crush you because you've created this perfect persona for so long. It, it's like a, it's a, you know, it's a, it just can't be messed with. And so I sat down and I, and I wrote this definition. I'm gonna put this out and uh, for you, you might wanna write this down or take a picture. We're gonna look at this because this is what I think perfection in our uh, culture in our context has actually become. And so I, I, I believe in definition, so I sat down and wrote this out. Perfectionism is the impossible demand that we place on ourselves in our relentless effort to achieve what we perceive as approval. Perfectionism is the impossible demand that we place on ourselves in our relentless effort to achieve what we perceive as approval. So, a couple things need to think about. So, if perfection is this, this thing, right? And it has to do See, look at what it, I spelled perfection wrong every single time I did this. Ah! I am not a perfectionist. I before E except after. It's E, I had it right the first time. And I can't forget it. We are not using this service for anything online. I'm going to have to look at this. God, you know when you spell something, it just looks wrong every time you do it? So it just happened. Can we like start this whole thing over? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. What you are trying to achieve is what you perceive of something that is, that is largely undetermined. It's largely undetermined. And perfectionism is to live under this burden. It's to live under this burden. So there are two essential curses that happen in this that will never be erased unless we do something different. Number one is the curse is that perfectionism rests on what we perceive as approval. It rests on what you perceive as approval. And here's the problem. It lies with you. What you are looking for is the approval of others as gauged by your own sense of whether they really approve or what you have done is really worthy of them approving of it. Because some of you know, other people have told you, you do well, you do fine, you've done this. Oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I was looking for. But you were unwilling to give yourself any credit for it. And to think that someone else's approval is finally going to mean enough to you is you're kidding yourself. And even if you start to sort of receive this approval, you will more than likely talk yourself out of it. Have you done this before? It's like you finally have done something, yourself, then you just talk yourself out of why it's no good and why it wasn't enough and why it should have been better. And number two is perfectionism robs us of actually what is required for perfection. It just, it absolutely makes it impossible and it keeps us in this vicious loop that we cannot get out of. Now, here's the interesting thing that, that kind of got me thinking. I'm, I can't believe I'm going to spell any words right. So those of you who are perfectionist, because this is what I, and this is what all emails are. They're like, Mike, um, if you, you can't just make perfection a bad thing because, and listen, I get it. Um, there are things that matter in how they're done. If you're operating on me, I'm not a perfectionist. We'll just put this there. Like, I, I'm, I'm not interested in that. If you're flying my plane, right, I need, I need a little, little pay attention to detail. So, I, so this is the problem, though. Because when you think about perfection, what's the opposite of it? For those of you who have wrestled, what's the opposite of it? Somebody said, 
imperfection. And what we end up thinking is sort of that the opposite of perfection is careless. And this is what you're terrified of. You're afraid that if you don't demand, if you don't, if you don't do, then, then somehow the whole world is going to pot. So I began to kind of noodle on this. This, this really is the basic, what, what the myth of perfectionism is that it has nothing to do with effort nor excellence. You can do things well and with excellence. You can produce beautiful things and great things and effective things without being a perfectionist. Perfectionist, remember, perfectionist is living under this burden where you're constantly trying to find something that you are perceiving that other people value or something has to do with your own sense of worth. And the reality is, is that thing doesn't actually exist. What the opposite of perfectionism, what, what actually, what, what, what the opposite of perfectionism is actually fullness. It's fullness. So what happens is, and just test yourself, right? If you've lived in this perfectionism kind of driven mindset, are you more full and more free or do you find yourself more empty, more anxious, more fearful? Which is it? It's the latter. So what you're doing, what we're doing isn't working. It isn't working because we have misunderstood what perfection actually is what perfectionism is. The opposite of perfectionism isn't carelessness, it's fullness. And we, what happens is we end up with this sense, and this is just the, this is the curse of this whole thing. We end up with this sense that we have to deserve our value or our worth by what we do because we don't trust that we could find it or have it otherwise. This is, I think, is where the gospel comes in and makes really writes everything. So here's the perfectionist verse. Matthew chapter five, verse 48. Here we go, you ready? Read this together, out loud. Go. Okay, all right, that was okay. It was not perfect by any stretch. <laughs> so let's read it one more time, very slowly, out loud. Even if you guys at home, read it out loud. Right, so what does God demand of you? <laughs> exactly. All right, we're done. We're going home. I'm going to pray and we're going to dismiss. So this is, this is the problem. Because when you hear that, what you almost immediately think is, well, that seems to be what he's saying. That God demands this Standard of perfect. We almost always hear it that way. So my question then, and this is why, like this is why I keep a journal, because I write these questions down. What is it about God's perfection that He expects of you? You ever thought of it? We just assume. Have you ever thought of it? Have you ever tried to wrestle and say, what is it of God's perfection? that I'm actually supposed to be. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What is it that's perfect about Him that is supposed to be evident in you? And what you begin to see is you find clues in what Jesus is saying. And I think this is why it's, it's unbelievable how over the years, you know, I've been kind of tinkering with kingdom and trying to understand rule and reign and authority and all these other things, that when you start to think like this, everything that you read in the Scriptures just begins to open up. Like it's literally like I've walked into a wide, like I was in a cave and you're looking, you're ducking and you just walked in. It's like everything just kind of opened up. It's what my journey has been like over the last five or six or seven years. And so what, what, what I began to think about when you look at this, if you go through Matthew 5, this is like the list. This is where Jesus says, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. But I tell you, if you hate someone, you've already murdered them. You know, and you're like, well, if I already said something bad, I might as well go ahead and finish it off. That's not the point of the message. Or it says, hey, if you've already, if you've, if you've looked at upon a woman, with, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But if you've looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already violated a thing. And, he just, and you're just like, it's just all this list. And it's quite a list. 
He goes through and he's talking about the tenacity with which we must possess our bodies and our minds, how we should interact and we respond to other people, stern warnings against lust and anger and contempt and manipulative language, using our words to get people to believe things about us that are not true. And then he does something incredibly, incredibly profound. He returns the law. I love this. I've never seen this. He returns the law to shalom. And there's two questions I want us to consider. Number one, and I'm going to try to do this without messing up. What does perfection do to grace? <laughs> Tony Rippa is one of our uh, staff writers. He's, he's, uh, he's kind of, his job is kind of to interpret my brain. He writes a lot of our devotions. If you read, he's the, he's the mastermind behind those. And he is a self-proclaimed perfectionist. We've had a great time talking about this. And I said, Tony, what, what does perfection do to grace? This is what he said. I, I love this. He said, grace feels like a participation trophy that everybody gets because they're losers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, you realize that grace is like the glory of God. The glories of God are revealed in his, the kindness of his grace. It's like a participation trophy. But think about what happens as a perfectionist, right? What happens to you? If you, if you make it and you are that, you feel enormous pressure to keep it going and to demand it from everybody else. And if you're not that, you just spend the rest of your life worthless or feeling worthless. Like perfectionism is marked by, by high anxiety and low confidence, I talk to people and, and they look confident. They look like everything's perfect, but just underneath the surface because the anxiety to hold that is so high and there's so much pressure that their confidence is so, because anything happens and their confidence is eroded. And part of things that what you, you heard in the opening uh, poem that was read, the opening reading, it says that what happens in perfection is we over-identify ourselves in our struggles. And this is one of the things that I see happening, particularly in social media. There's a big push for vulnerability and a big push, and we just identify, we become identified as our struggle. And we get out and we say, oh, I'm really struggling with this today. And then everybody approves us in that struggle. And they say, oh, you're so brave for coming out in that struggle. And guess what happens to you? It becomes another form in which you just sort of elevate this, and it's all all sort of this mask of what's happening underneath that we can't seem to find a sense of self or fullness. And it's because we keep thinking that we care, we, this, the opposite is something other than what it is. And then grace feels like basically just this, well, you couldn't really do it, well, so I'll give you a trophy anyway. And that's not what grace is. It's far more powerful than that. But that's what perfectionism does to grace. It just diminishes it to basically, well, if, here you go, anyway. Good try. There are lots of things that I've learned to struggle with. I'm gonna tell some baking stories next week. I can make cupcakes and decorate cakes. And maybe if this preaching thing doesn't go well, um, I might do that. Hammocks and St. John are a little bakery thing going on. And so, but it, it's, it's, it's so funny because what we all know, we all know that who you are who you are becoming is far more important than what you do. We all know this. I do corporate events all the time with companies and businesses. And I go in, I ask them two questions. I say, how many of you guys have a to-do list? Everybody's like, oh, I got a to-do list. Do you know why I have a to-do list? Because dang it, I'm a perfection, perfectionist. And that's how you get things done. Everybody's proud of their to-do list. And I say, how many of you guys have a to-be list? And it's usually crickets. And sometimes it's tears. Do you know why? Because they realize that their pursuit to get things done has stolen something from who they actually are. So if you begin to flip the question, what then does grace do to your perfection? And this is where I want for us to spend the next three weeks talking about. So this list, lust, 
Uh, he talks about divorce in there, which don't, please don't go, don't feel any shame. We'll talk about that another time. It's just in there. He talks about anger and contempt and manipulation and all these things. And then he returns the law to this rule of love. And here's what he says. You've heard this. You've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? If someone does this to you, you do that back to them. But I say to you, if someone requires you, or someone wants your, 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 uh, your coat, give them your outer garment as well, right? If someone wants one thing, you give them something else. If someone requires you to go one mile, what do you do? You go two. If someone hits you on one cheek, you turn and you offer your other one. What, what is he doing here? It's interesting, think about this. So there was actually a law in that culture, a Roman soldier could require, could commandeer you and say, I need you to carry my pack. And you were obligated to carry it for a mile, for a distance. And so when that happened, you did that. And what you're doing, you carry it one mile. You're doing what needs to be done. You're doing what's expected. You're doing what's required. And you get to the end of that mile and you keep going. What's the Roman soldier doing? He says, asking a question. What are you doing? I take my pack back. You don't have to do that anymore. Did you realize what you've done? You've actually introduced him to another way of life. You've introduced him to grace. When someone says, right, he goes on and he says, then all these are framed. You've heard it said to love your friends and to hate your enemies, but I tell you to love your enemies. Because everybody knows that people who love you, you love them back. But what does it say to someone when you love them, even though they have wished you harm? or want bad things for you. You begin to raise questions, right? If you extend yourself to someone, it's another story, it's another way. And then, then, after this, after sort of returning this to this, I'm, I'm calling this the way of grace, when, when someone does more than you expected of them or more than was required of them, it compels you to ask and wonder, what is it about you that made you do that? Why would you do that for me? And then he says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Be careful, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Most of us never read these two things together because it's in two chapters. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be careful not to practice your righteous in front of men in order to what? To be seen by them, in order to find approval in them, in order to get their that a boy from them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And this again sounds like a threat. What is it about God's perfection that he expects from us? So here's what I did. And, and I want to kind of walk you through this because I want you to maybe write some things down or you can take a picture. This will be on, um, it's on the outline. But I want you to have a couple of statements because all I can do today is hopefully uh, compel you to think differently. But what happens is when we, and the idea of, if you think about this, when someone goes an extra mile for you, you say, what is it about you that's making you do that? This is actually what righteousness means. When he says, don't practice your righteousness, it's, it's the essence, it's the inner thing that causes you or makes you represent good. What's good? That would be how the Greeks would have understood this. And, and the reason this is important because what he says is don't practice that thing to get it validated by other people. If that happens, you're always going to end up sort of looking around you, trying to compare yourself to other people, competing with everybody. And this is, a, this is an epidemic in our culture. I, I've raised two girls uh, into, into uh, almost into adulthood and they're somewhat sane and they're great kids. 
But I remember when they were kids, when we were playing sports or grades or colleges or everything, what you felt like is that you owed everybody else an explanation as to why your kids were only playing one sport or why they weren't playing year round or why they weren't trying to get into Harvard or UNC or wherever else it was. You felt like you owed everybody an explanation to that. That's the warning in Matthew 6. Do not exercise your righteousness in order to be seen and to be approved and to play games. What I always tell people, and Julie and I, my wife and I, tell us all the time, you cannot lose a game you ain't playing. And that's what I have resolved. And you, it is a war because everybody around you almost always, and it's, it's in business, it's in the church. When I go to conferences, guess what every pastor who's there asks me almost out of the gate, other than where your church is? How big it is. Oh, let's keep score. You know what that does? to your heart, to your head, when you're ahead? Do you know what it does to your heart, to your head when you're behind? So this is what happens. You look on your phone and you see pictures of people and you immediately scale yourself. Am I as thin as her? Am I as buff as him? Do I have as many followers? Do I have as many likes? Do I have this? I mean, we're, we're constantly... And this is all, what he says is you've got to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect and beware not to get sucked in to finding worth and value in all these secondary ways. And what he connects this to is our sense of worth. It's interesting when you think about what does grace do to perfectionism? I can't get too far ahead of myself. Let me just say this. Perfection is only found in struggle. It's, it only happens. This is what James says. We're talking more about this. And most of us, we try in our perfectionistic mindset to eliminate struggle from our lives. And in doing so, you actually eliminate any hope of the kind of perfection that God has for you. Struggle is fine. What I tell myself, when, if you're an adult and you read, when's the last time you had to use a dictionary? Because when you read a word that you don't know, I'm just not smart enough. This book ain't for me. Or you just pretend. I know what propinquity is. That's cool. I look at words all the time. I wish I could read faster. I wish I was smarter. I wish I, there's a lot of things about me I wish. But none of those are what God has demanded of me and be perfect as I am perfect. That's not how God is perfect. The word perfect literally means complete, whole, enough, full. Be complete as I am complete. Be full as I am full. How does that sound different? Hopefully a lot. That's exactly what he's taught us, exactly what he means. The warning to the next is there's something that's been made available to you in your relationship with your father so that you don't have to play a game. You can't lose a game that you're not playing. Your career, your home, your car, your kids, your looks, your gifts, they're, they're not metrics of keeping score in a game. There's a connection to process and time. You have to walk through things. You have to be willing. I, I wait till next week to tell you all that. I just can't do it. I don't have time. I want to get through this. You and I are human beings. It is present tense. It's present tense. It's interesting when God introduces him, Clay talked about this at Overflow last week. When God introduces himself to Moses, God, Moses is going to meet with Pharaoh and he says, hey, when I get to Pharaoh, who should I tell him sent me? And God says, you tell him that I, I am that I am. There's this present tense presence to God and what he's doing. What I have learned about grace Grace comes to us, not like a bank account that we stock up over here so we can just draw from it when we need it. It's sort of a safe, it only comes in the moment. 
And then once that moment's gone, there was sufficient grace for it. We have to trust him in the next. And we've talked about this a lot. Time is a care. You know, people say time heals all wounds. Time does not heal wounds. Time carries grace and grace heals wounds. It's grace that does this. So what does grace do to perfectionism? It actually destroys it. It causes it to become something else because gra- what grace doesn't just cover what, what people think is that what grace does to perfectionism, it just makes the, the cruddy stuff okay. That's not what it does. Grace, right? G- grace allows you to continue even though things aren't yet done or complete or full. It allows you to be complete when nothing else is. Some of you can't sit still, you can't rest, you can't do anything until everything is perfect and it's killing you. It's killing you. You can't enjoy your kids, you can't enjoy your downtime, you can't enjoy rest, you can't enjoy anything because everything isn't perfect. And so when I thought about this, the challenge of being a human being is it is always present tense. It's always now. And what you are doing, who you are becoming right now matters more than anything else. This is sort of the food for thought for next week. And I just wrote this down. I'm gonna submit this to you that the human being that you will one day become is not yet who you are. You know this, right? The human being that you will become, you aren't yet that person. So you're going to have to become the human being you will one day be. Does it make sense? This isn't a process. This is actually life. And if you keep thinking that when you finally get there, you'll experience life, you are going to miss everything about life, everything about grace, and everything about your only hope for perfection. Because it's available in the moment. It's available in the moment. What a lot of times the problem with perfectionists is it robs us of the process, we are intolerant of it. And the moments along the process are not valuable. They don't matter simply because they got you to your goal. The moments matter because that's actually where you experience God's grace. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. One of the things that I do in my own personal time, is when I read a verse that I don't like or that bothers me or I suspect I'm reading wrong, is I open up my journal and I write it out at the top of the page. And I go do a lot of word studies and look stuff up and try to understand and try to come up and write it in my own words. Uh, Eugene Peterson has done this in his uh, translation of the Bible, paraphrase of the Bible, called The Message. And he translates these two passages uh, from... Uh, 5, 48 to 6, 1. He says, you know, be perfect as I am perfect. This is how he writes it. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives towards you. The world is not a stage Be especially careful when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but God won't be applauding. Right, he's trying to get our eyes up. So what I did in the word be, it's really interesting. This isn't a word advocating more effort from you or from me. It's actually a word that's very relational. It means to exist or to be identical, and it has to do with our identity. To be complete, to exist in fullness. How different does that sound? Exist in fullness as your heavenly Father exists in fullness. How different does that sound to you? How freeing does that feel for you? Again, this has nothing to do with lowering your standards or making things slack. It has everything to do with your heart coming alive in the moments and the things that you need to enjoy that other people need you present in so you don't crush everybody along the way. So I wrote this down in mind is simply this, to exist in the image in which I have been made. 
What this requires is for me to remain in the presence of the heavenly Father in this moment, to, for him, to see him so that I don't end up chasing and comparing and playing a game that was never actually intended to play. It's the best I can do today. God, I ask that you would help us to think differently. God, I know there are folks in here who they are struggling so deeply because of tests or the demands of school or the demands of a job or the demands of a parent or the pressure of expectations or a million other things. God, this is a burden we, we are not intended to carry. For some they've carried it too long and enough is enough. So just use this moment to seal some things in our hearts and to awaken us perhaps to new things. We find that we get to exist in your fullness, in your presence. And so let us return to you. And I'll lift this name of your son, Jesus, who is our King. Why don't you stand as we close together this song?